for this series, we will have done 36 interviews. So you can buy some of them out there, but you can also get it all you can watch every one of them for free in the library. The library is open to the public. It's a gorgeous library in the ground floor of this building. So please take advantage of it. This is the self-serving part. This has nothing to do with the foundation, but they've been nice enough to let me announce that my friend Wendy Goldman and I are going to teach a little writing workshop. It's improv for writing. And so they're improv writing games, so you don't get up and perform, but they're little writing games. And... Um, if anyone's interested, you can send an email to this email address, and there's also a sign-up where you can put your email, and I'll get in touch with you, improvforwriting at gmail.com. So just how it sounds, and um, F-O-R. And, um, and it'll be really fun. Wendy, these guys all know Wendy Goldman, and Wendy and I were in the Growlings together, and we just thought this would be fun, but it has nothing to do with the foundation. They're just letting me plug it. But it's Michael Patrick and Lisa approved. Yes. It's Michael Patrick and Lisa approved. It'll be really fun. And now we're back, and let's take some more questions. Um, yes. And then we'll go to you next. So obviously you both have first-hand experience in the production of putting on sitcoms, but the depiction of putting together a reality show seems equally knowing. Can you talk about, like, your research in terms of that? And beyond, you know, what airs on TV, because like you said, it was going to be called raw footage. So it seems very insider. Uh, we had uh, we asked Henriette Mantel, who had worked on this season, uh, the first season of the Osbournes, to come in and talk to us. And we got a, a, like a lot of bullet points about what they think about everything from getting the non-union kids to go get lunch to whatever. And then we wound up just sort of tailor making it to our idea of what we assume is happening on the fringe, right. right? Yeah, yeah. We suspected that it was all very manipulated and that... And we actually saw footage from a, a reality show. Mm -hmm. We saw unedited footage and... and I don't even remember. I don't, Do you? No, I don't remember. I, I'm, I'm a celebrity. Get me out of here. <laughs> Something like know. that. But I'm a celebrity. Get me out of here. What did that raw footage say to you that you were seeing? I mean, what did it that say? That we had to be very careful because it was boring. <laughs> right. It was yeah. really yeah. boring. Because life is, life is boring. Well, yeah. Un, I mean, unshaped. Unshaped Shaped life is boring. And so what we realized when we saw it was like, okay, what we're doing in our minds is we're show the comeback episodes are the first assembly of the assistant editor <laughs> who cut out a lot of boring shit. So what you're seeing is a very raw collection of moments. But the actual tapes were vast and dull. But it did inspire part of an episode. That the paint we were, drawing? Yeah, the paint drawing. And then going to return linens. That that, you know, that was a hard one. A that was really It was hard. hard because we, we wanted to show exactly that <laughs> aspect of reality shows that you That know, girl writing that was Jim the girl's on Glee. She just now she's on Glee. She plays a teacher. Yeah. Jim or whatever her name is. She's great. But um she just writing we would say, <laughs> just slow down. <laughs> Because we wanted Lisa, and that was the episode about Lisa worrying about being up against other reality shows. Right. And then reality was hilarious. The three cameras and yeah, yeah, yeah. God, that was great. And was that the one where we had the Charla? Charla. Oh my God. Yeah. From Amazing. For Race. those of you who don't, didn't watch Amazing oh Race, my God. oh my God, that was like unbelievable. The the um, little person who. Was Lisa's assistant was from the Amazing Race. Well, that is what that is actually one of my favorite takes. When Lisa sees her the first time, when Valerie sees her, like here's your new assistant, and she comes in and Lisa stands up and she's right here, and Lisa's just Valerie's just trapped, not reacting. Lisa sits down again. Yeah, she sits right there. Hello. <laughs> but again, that panic over. The cover of Entertainment Weekly, our reality show's dead, and then she's seeing that nothing fun, nothing good's happening. Here. And you realize that when we were putting that fictionally on the cover of Entertainment Weekly, mm -hmm. people were already saying reality shows were dead, and they're still not dead. <laughs> but they also became more like what you were d doing. I mean, they 
like like you're but saying so far beyond that they that whole thing about you know the 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 like this is a way if your career is flagging just invite cameras into your home i mean in other words that kind of thing didn't really happen when you were making this show but then it began to happen it is, like 2 seconds later but they do on real housewives of it's her name here uh is so brutal to those people that i can't i all i keep saying in my head is they're never coming back from that well, he killed himself. You know. Yes, that, of course. And but, they, but then they still want to do it the next season. Yeah, but they're never coming back. I keep thinking of Valerie. Like, they're never coming back from that because those cameras are going away. Right. They're going away. And what's going to be left is the destruction right. and the lack of cameras, <laughs> which is very Valerie. Like, right. what happens if it goes away then? You had it and it went away again. Now right. what? The yawning emptiness of you. And your life. Yeah. Becoming invisible again. Right. It's almost like flowers for Algernon. Yeah. Yeah, it's like. (laughs) (laughs) And is it better to have had that level of I love this crowd that you all got that. (laughs) Don't you? I know you heard me trail off just in case. (laughs) I thought you I mean, that level of bullshit fame, like, is it better to have had that? Like... Teresa Giudici or whatever her name is, is it better to have done that and had two bestsellers than to never have done that? I don't well, know. If you really want to talk about it for a second, I always think about the children. I can't help but think about the children. They didn't they didn't wake up one day and go, I think I want cameras in my house. I mean, oof. I love that ring. It's so 1998. <laughs> oh, and how about her ring? Oh, my God. Oh, that ring, ring was like another character. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And that whole thing where she's like, I'm not going to answer the phone, and it (laughs) keeps going off. It's like, just don't silence it. No, let's not (laughs) silence it. Let's make sure I hear it every one minute. Uh, There was a gentleman here, and then we'll uh, we'll go over to that side. I was just wondering if there was any minefield that you would not have sent Valerie into. Is there any idea that you came up with that you said, oh, no, we can't? Nope. I, I really can't think of anyone. Saying yes, and he's saying no. <laughs> Can you think of one? Yes, um, that she actually snaps. Remember, there was talk about her actually having to... Go into an institution. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I believe I was right. Because <laughs> you could have pulled it off. She could have pulled it off. Absolutely. Lisa could have pulled it off. Absolutely. She could have pulled it off. And it is based on a fact, and you know, I know, I know a star who went in one and came out, so it could happen. Initials? Robin Schiff. <laughs> Thank you for thinking I'm a star. <laughs> well, you are, darling. <laughs> okay, on this side of the room, um, the lady with the, the funny ring. Oh, thank you. Lisa, this question is for you, first of all, and very honored to be in your presence. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> as far as it goes, you acting, portraying the character, and writing the character, which was more entertaining to you? Which did you look forward to? Did you like being the writer? Did you like being the actress? Which one was the best for you? Well, it felt the same, in a way. Because I was the character you know, while we were doing it. And then it was also fun to be Juna, and fun to be Mark, and fun to be Polly. Polly. Tom Peterman actually is the one who you were more Polly and I was Tom Peterman. <laughs> yeah. And Jimmy, that was very fun to be Jimmy. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it. Uh, yes. Um, Hi there. Um, you guys satirize not only reality TV but scripted television too. And I, I, I think my favorite was I'm It. And I, I wonder. <laughs> Where yeah. you got, it, I'm sure it was an amalgam of several late 80s shows, but if you could elaborate on that. and um, You just did. Yeah. <laughs> How deep can you go? <laughs> well, we, we had a, we, first of all, we, we actually, one of our favorite tragic phrases that Valerie says, and I'm sorry to say a lot of actresses say this, I'm really good with physical comedy. <laughs> And the idea that we were down there actually 
having to show Valerie doing physical comedy, getting her thing <laughs> caught, and oh, Mike, and and we were we in our minds we were writing the what Valerie thought was the Sam and Diane final kiss moment <laughs> on Cheers, but in her mind, I'm it was that like this, and Mickey's are going mm-hmm like. Oh, it was so mm-hmm. I'm looking at her like, wink, wink, your finest hour. Oh, it's just delicious. But I actually ran down. I didn't direct that episode, but I was like, oh, I'm directing. I'm it. And Lisa and I were down. And we were hooking her thing on the keyboard and computer and that bad New York drop. And then she runs out and runs back in. Oh, what the hell? Oh, God. And the file cabinet. The and file you know, cabinet. There, and that was a... T- there was yeah, a time, yeah, and, he, and the choreography, the, and, the, and, <laughs> and it was interesting because there was a time when television, almost, it even though there was so fewer channels, it felt like there were so many more of those shows that didn't make a dent, that were just on and on for two or three seasons, and you're like, oh, that show. So it was fun to go into that uh, arena of mediocrity, and still try to make Valerie shine. You know, she was it. It it was uh, the outfit, the the suit reminded me um, <laughs> of uh, Who's the Boss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah Angelin, yeah. Who's the Boss, was yeah. always wearing yeah, those yeah. like business and the, suits. And the hair that didn't yeah. change. Yeah. <laughs> Barely changed. <laughs> right. That was really hilarious. Uh, yes. Uh, wait for the mic. Suspense. Thank you. Um, I grew up in Belgium, and uh, it's kind of very like a, living like it's sort of a dream to be here listening to you and learning from you. And you made me laugh so, for so many years, both of you in different uh, shows. But um, so I'm very interested to know, um, growing up, what are the shows, what are the uh, comedy shows that you uh, even now? When you uh, watch TV, you, you have to finish that episode. Whatever shows that you think are really living in you, even if you don't necessarily think about it when you are writing. Well, I love Lucy. Just because even though it was broad, every single second counted. You know, played it for real. She could do physical comedy. Also. And uh, she, she, could. she could. And I can't. Which was ironic about doing that bit because I actually Lisa, cannot do physical Lisa's comedy. first wave of anything is, and I can't do that. <laughs> and then she masters it. Um, uh, you know, oddly enough, I have a copy of the Vitamita Vegman speech from um, uh, Lucy, and every single thing she does is written. Everything. The wink to the camera, and it's all that. Um, I remember two things. I remember, of course, one being like uh, uh, salivating over Carol Burnett's about to come on. Like, I just remember being like, Carol Burnett's coming on. <laughs> Carol Burnett's <laughs> going to come Burnett on at show. 10 Me o'clock. Too. I'm staying Carol up. Carol Burnett's show. It's Carol Burnett's coming on. <laughs> I, I remember that. I, I was like, what's that going to be? And all in the family. And yes. And all I'm older, family. so I was, uh, I was very in, uh, addicted to like the idea of laughing. Well, like what? Oh, those all those people. But as a grown-up, the first sort of character I was like, boom, was Rhoda. Because I thought what was so interesting about Rhoda, and I hadn't really clocked it, was that Rhoda knew she was funny. Rhoda actually had a sense of humor, and was, and I found that incredibly engaging. That a funny character, not somebody whose jokes are being written by the writers but that Rhoda actually knew she was funny and saying funny things. I found really riveting for some reason. Mm-hmm. We actually have a writer from the Mary Tyler Moore show Yeah, Mary Tyler Moore. In, in the front row, and she was the voice of Rhoda. Oh, my God. Oh my God. Right. Treva, Treva Silverman. Treva, well, you see, I was riv- so <laughs> obvious. But you know what I mean, right? But this wasn't She planned. was funny. This is an unplanned, just it just happened. Totally spontaneously. Um, it wasn't just that that we put um, cameras on uh, getting reaction shots. It was that she uh, indicating that last line was funny, but she she was like a comedy writer in that she was funny. Rhoda was funny, and um, I always thought that it it 
reflected very well on Mary for having her as a best friend. That she, she just adored, absolutely adored her. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that you rarely saw somebody laughing at another character, like that it wasn't for the audience, but for the other person in the room. You know, that Mary yeah. was laughing at Rhoda. I found that really compelling. Yeah, well, well, Rhoda was Rhoda was the hey, suppose we and Mary was the oh, we can't person, yeah. but right. Mary pretty much always went went along with it. Yeah, but that's 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 right. That's that's exactly right. That that it wasn't for the audience. Oh, what a stupid thing that one said. It wasn't that. It was that she was genuinely genuinely funny. But yeah. that show, the Mary Tyler Moore show, had more interesting women characters than any other show because Rhoda of course but Betty White's character Phyllis Phyllis, Phyllis. Was fantastic they were such strong characters and it wasn't just because they were too cute or too clumsy or homely and so well, you know they, I were, mean, they were greatly flawed they were flawed and they were allowed to be real women with real lives and complicated things happened to them and yeah, they That's were. That's probably like the seminal show for a lot of people, the Mary Tyler Moore show, I yeah. think. Well, yeah, I mean, it is a coincidence that Treve is here tonight, um, but yeah. I. <laughs> She's a fan. Winnie, is it really? Yes, but. Or is it like the water in the wall? It all became about this moment that was set up earlier. But I did always I... wonder if. But I did always wonder if that was ever an issue like from the network you know if anyone was nervous about these women like they're going to be really unlikable you know Phyllis is going to be so unlikable and Sue Ann and <laughs> thank you um, no it was that wasn't that wasn't an issue in fact it was set it was set up like um Oh, what's that word when cross ventilation? It was set up like cross ventilation that each of them had somebody who they were in conflict with, so that Rhoda was exactly the opposite of of, Clo of, of Phyllis, and they would always have a, an instant thing, and uh, with with Sue Ann Nivens, it w uh, that was more she was more to be laughed at. Um, and, and, well, actually what happened was uh, Ed Weinberger wrote the character of Sue Ann, and he wrote it um, thinking about Betty White. And he said, a Betty White type, a Betty White type. And then some unsung hero said, hey, how about... <laughs> so that's how that happened. He didn't even think uh, in, in the first place of going to her. No, there was never, there was never any... Um, Anything about nope, too many women spoil spoil the broth. Um, I guess because I I don't know. At the beginning, they were they were hovering over every single script, and you can't do this, you can't do that. But it was never a thing of um, it was never a thing of of too many women. Well, well now have so many unreasonable <laughs> women in a show. Now it's a thing. Now it's a thing of. Yeah. Now it's a thing. Um, well put. <laughs> it appears to be a thing. Uh, this, yeah, right there. Hi, I know you guys said you know you knew where the show was going, but how much did you have um, did you have fleshed out before you felt comfortable taking it to HBO? Was it just the pilot? Did oh, you just have? The pilot. Okay. Well, you stopped us. I mean, we kept talking about things. You said, "Ho, ho, ho!" Now we understand we have a season. But you guys Please. knew you guys knew the season, but you weren't telling them. Is that what you're saying? No, no we didn't no. hammer it out. We got, that's what we used okay. all the writers for and stuff. Because uh, we actually discovered as a room, it wasn't like Lisa and I sat. We had an impulse and we had a pilot, and then we knew where we were going to go with the writers. We had a when we started, we had each of the titles of the episodes. Valerie stands up for herself. Valerie shines. Da 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 da. And it was like important that Valerie's name be in. So we knew where we were going. But I'm a little confused now. When you pitched it to HBO, did you pitch it just the pilot, or did you feel like you had to pitch? And then this is where we're going to get to. Uh, we said it was about a woman being destroyed slowly. I mean, we designed the poster which is Valerie standing in a meat in grinder. In a meat grinder, right. So we were like, this is the poster. And they were like, all right. <laughs> 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 the, 
Valerie so happy from the knees up and her dress is coming out of the meat grinder like she's being ground. So that was what we knew we were doing. A woman is ground up by her need. But it was never like, and she gets a happy ending or anything so like didn't that. Say, you didn't say, never. You didn't say like the show's going to get picked up at the end for a no, no. You know. Okay, that's interesting to me. And maybe just to me, but... No. Oh, yes. I think we did have the thought that the very end episode, everything that you saw was going to be edited to oh, yeah. her disadvantage. Oh, we yeah. did we have really the last, the, show. the climax of the first season was everything that you'd seen would be re-edited against her. So we did know that the last show was going to be well, that's th- the actual thing. pilot, the first episode of the comeback. But we kept seeing this thing like an Escher drawing like you know wow there's no end i mean ultimately we could even have a separate show that is just the comeback we could have additional material that is just room and board right we could have done room and board too yeah thinking about like how fun would it be if we can then just do all these things i must say that this is what you always this is the dream for a pilot idea this feel to me, this feeling that is just gushing, that story is just gushing forth, and you're not going to have to worry, where am I going to take it? What's the story going to be next year? And then it's fun. It's like got that fun of when you're a kid playing with yeah. toys. And without that, I, it's very nerve wracking and terrifying. Well, that was because we had a, a really evocative, strong character. Right. So we knew anywhere we went, we but could. But I think that's a great point because I know there are a lot of writers in the room, and I think. Um, you're saying that the, that that strong, complicated, just riveting character is what you is really the strength and what you're kind of looking for. That was in a what, that was the franchise, right, Valerie? Exactly. Character first, but also what was kind of I thought easy was so what would happen next, and it was just the next logical thing. Like, well, then they have the upfronts. Right. Well, and then you have that you know that first. Table episode read. that table read with the network and it's really tense then you have the actors trying to get along and bond right. and we knew you know well you're going to have when the show premieres and that's really nerve-wracking right. like we knew what all sort of like the temples that would actually happen out. that it laid out right. to me like we really followed logically. a very traditional oh and then the show shut down and then the surprise was Too nobody late. gets fired they bring in two more characters oh my we- god the beauty boys and also the <laughs> would you do the making fun of the Beatty Boys? No? Yes? It's making fun of them? Well, yeah. When the you robot? The yeah. Boys. Beep, bop, beep, bop. <laughs> no. You don't have to. Yeah, I'll Lisa, do it right because I don't remember. You're my train, Mike. Go to them and you say to them, oh, that's, you go to them and you, you tell Mark how funny. That's classic oh, Valerie. All oh, right. A destructive force comes into the sitcom, which is going to take her, her camera time away, right. and she decides to like it. <laughs> And be, they're so funny and edgy because she's not antique. She's like, what's happening? You know, what's happening in the world? What do I need? So she tells Mark they're so cute and does it for them. And Mark doesn't get it. And that's when she's like, oh, they're edgy. Anyway. (laughs) And then she goes and does it to them. And they bust her balls so hard. And then she says, dicey mix, improv and comics. (laughs) Dicey Actors and improv, improv, no, actors and comics, dicey mix. Always a dicey mix. Well, while we're talking about the Beatty Boys, I love when C- the character of Chris gets really upset because the Beatty Boys are there oh, and no. they cut out <laughs> the Bibler. Their dicks were in socks. His dick was going to be in a sock. <laughs> and there wasn't going to be time for it now. Uh, no, right. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> Chris is so upset. Kellen Lutz. Yeah. Oh, that was very funny. Uh, oh, that that gentleman there, and then we'll go to you next. Thank you. Hi, um, this is such a great panel. I love all four of you, and you're all great writers. Who do you like best, though? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you said earlier that you salivated over Carol Burnett coming on TV, and I salivated when on Sunday nights when the comeback was coming on TV, and I'd be like, get the popcorn. You know, it was so exciting. So when it was not coming back, I was devastated, and I still don't understand what happened. <laughs> yeah, it didn't make any sense because, like you said, you were building an audience, and, and it was great, and everybody was catching on and loving it. And I mean, HBO tends to want to, you know, keep things on for more than a season, right? It did. 
This is the first that time the they first didn't. That was the first moment. Yeah, so, so what, did, were there didn't. rumblings or, uh, that it wasn't going to come back? No, listen, it was... I don't uh, know what... I, I just act, had to ask. We actually yeah. went in with our clout uh, at episode eight and said... It, I'll tell you what I said. I said, this is turning around. I can feel it. People are starting to understand right after Palm Springs, as you said, pick us up now. I said, pick us up now, and Lisa will get an Emmy nomination. Pick us up now and get behind this show and show that it's coming back, and uh, it will be framed differently from what it's been framed, which was just like, what's that? Is that fat actress? Is that a Kirstie like Alley no show? Is it, it is. like that? Remember? Yeah. That was like, is it like Kirstie Alley? Is she playing herself? And so we, I dragged Lisa in, and I basically used every thought, and they said, uh, they said, uh, we won't let you down. Was not picked up. And Lisa did get a nomination anyway, and I'm, I'm telling you, as sure as I'm sitting here, if we had been picked up, she would have won because it's the most defining performance of anyone in a complicated comedy ever, in my opinion. And it just didn't come back. And we were told the day after the Emmys, when we both didn't win, I was nominated for both director, that it wasn't coming back. So we still, to this day, don't know why. The only thing I can think of, it was at a time when HBO was hit gluttony. Everything on their show was a big hit. And that it time was, has passed. It was Sopranos, Sex in the City, and Six Feet Under. Right. And they had a big app, like a show needed to have a critical raves and numbers. But they forgot that Sex in the City started very tiny numbers. Right. And this grows and grows and grows. So we kept telling them, bring us, bring us back. It never happened. Even with everybody throwing every bit of weight. It, we never understood why. I also remember that the thing I remember about that meeting was me saying, I just hear a lot of people talking about they're watching it on demand. Oh. So how's that going? And <laughs> what was said was, on demand. well, we can't possibly know what's happening. We don't know what's going that on. That was at the we beginning. Don't know what those numbers Lisa are. kept saying on demand. And they said, we, there's no way of us clocking. There's what no way on of us knowing is. what that means. That seems and like I the thought, one thing you would actually know where there would be right, actual like, oh, too. data. Oh. Like, well, it's too bad they hadn't invented counting <laughs> <laughs> yet. How do you not know? I, we have. We have got. That was the funniest amazing. bullshit that answer I'd ever heard. I mean, it was a, it was a great mystery. It was, and it, it was the mystery of it that was so hard to figure, to right. let go of. The right. mystery of it. Right. How many tickets have you sold? No, we wouldn't be able to. T we don't know. We don't. I mean, how can you possibly calculate that number? Yeah. <laughs> I just wasn't what they thought they were supposed to be doing, I guess. No, they had gotten bad press for the first time in however many years because they had shows before us that hadn't done well and they were kind of insider industry stuff. And that was our rotten luck. Um, again, I just foolishly thought, well, in the history of HBO, they have never really canceled a show after just one season. So we'll be fine because right. then everyone's going to figure it out. <laughs> well, I also feel like right. that there was, and this is completely anecdotal, but around the Palm Springs episode, there were people who had kind of stuck with it, even though it made them really uncomfortable. And then... At that point, it was like people were like, I can't wait to oh see this God. show. Yeah. And and I did feel what you were talking about, Michael, is just this this shift of passion where it was still uncomfortable to watch, but it was a little more fun. It, you know, it had sort of crossed over to, the, well, to that. I mean, when you think about anything that's ever broken ground or been different, it takes that that is a TV show. It takes a few episodes for people to understand what it is, what they're watching. Well, I mean, but look at my so-called life. Yeah, I mean, anything new. Right, anything right. new, or or I'm th even thinking of Seinfeld because you know this the famous story about how you know it, they, they they left it on because they had no idea, they didn't really have anything to put on after it. I mean, instead of it, but they didn't like it and it wasn't doing good, and so they just left it on while they left it on. People started to understand, oh, I get it. It's a different kind of show. And people started to really, really love it. But it, if, you know, they, it, 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 you need with a show that is completely breaking ground to, to have a few 
cracks at it so people can get comfortable and then they can fall in love. I mean, that's the thing is that then they fall hard because they kind of discovered it and they, they, they feel like it's their thing, right? It's like their secret. And we had little, you know, even in the like, oh, you're not getting picked up, uh, maybe you're not going to get picked up, we'd get little, little pops of like ego boost. Like we got a call once David Bowie's going on tour and he won't be in town. Can he have the last four episodes? <laughs> Like, oh, well, David Bowie likes it. So, Friend. you know, That's David it. Bowie. I mean, I think he knows what's Someone funny. Someone let HBO know. Ziggy Stardust wants to know what happens to Valerie, so fuck you. <laughs> oh, my God, I love there that. There were, like, weird, like, it'd be like Salvador Dali thinks it's good. Oh, all right. There's there's a um, there's a young lady. Uh, I'm sorry, this back. woman and then, yeah. and then you. Okay. Okay, so this woman Hi. first and then in the back. Um, first, all I want to say is that I really, really love the comeback, and um, that's the first thing. Um, <laughs> and um, something that I just found really interesting about it was, uh, you know, she was on this quest to be, you know, seen, like you said. But also, uh, some of the most poignant moments for me were just sort of like the the trauma and the lack of control that she felt. Um, and there just seemed to be a lot of uh, footage devoted to that. And I was just wondering. Uh, was this story, was it important to you also as, you know, a woman? Uh, like, was was that a purposeful sort of dynamic that you guys were exploring? Uh, because it just seems so, like, truthfully and uniquely the experience sometimes of being looked at as a woman. Mm-hmm. And we talked about it in my film fem- feminist theory class in college, so <laughs> whatever. Love that. That's interesting. I love your question. Yeah. Okay. I have a lot to say on this, and there's no time. But there's plenty of time, Lisa. What? There's time. As long as we're all here, go for it. All right. One thing I want to say that Michael said early on was he was worried twice. One of them was, I think we're a little too ahead of the curve. Yeah, we're on HBO. It's fine. <laughs> They're going to leave us on forever, and people will catch up. Okay. <laughs> then he said... Another time, I'm worried because it's a woman and we don't have a point of reference for this. With men, you have a point of reference for absolutely everything. But with women, you don't have a point of reference for this person. Can you explain that more? Michael. Um, (laughs) um, Never been a female female asshole character in the lead. Um, as somebody who's her own, who's not a villain, who isn't the avenging witch, who's not, you know, the vampire. There's never, there's been, there's, you know, there's, you know, Ricky Gervais in the office. People knew there have been male heroes. There have been male fools. There have been male idiots. There have been male wise people. But there haven't, there was never up to, in our opinion, there hadn't been a woman this naked emotionally who couldn't be typed as a mother, a daughter, a, vi- a sex bomb, a vixen. Am I making sense? No, now you are. Now, now I get it. I there had never been it. this character as a woman uh, out there yet, I don't think, in a comic. And that's really important in a comic way. Laugh at her. Right. And laugh at Chaplin. Laugh at this guy. Laugh at this guy. Don't laugh at her. And as I'm wrong a lot, as you can see, I didn't know what he was talking about. Because all I thought about this character in this show was, no, it's about a human being that everyone would recognize. I don't under, I didn't under, what does it matter? So there's never been a woman. I don't get it. But it seemed like a big part of it, and and Valerie actually says it, is that um, they don't want to fuck her, and so they really don't know what to do with her. And it really did feel, you know, um, there is, there really is in, in the business towards actresses and also, especially in comedy, you and I have talked about this, real hatred towards women, and, I, and, I, and a real... Um, fear of women and I feel like that's supposed to be the last bastion of men where men can just be brutal you can be brutal to everyone and and that um, 
and and I did feel like it was particularly tough on her because she was a woman. The other thing was I I I thought she was naked. I have written many women characters that, who are in pain or making mistakes, but the joke was they're all dressed up. And Valerie wasn't. Mm-hmm. She was just standing there in the spotlight, like looking at you. And there was not a lot of uh, filigree around her. So it w- that was what we were trying to do. The opposite of right. what's been done. Show her. Well, now two, one very disturbing th- uh, realization I had happened when a couple years after that, I saw Bill Maher talking about, and I don't remember exactly what it was about, but he was talking about how, you know, you're not allowed to make fun of the victim. The white man (laughs) in this country is in the power position, and everyone else is not in the power position, and you cannot make fun of the victim. And I went, oh, okay, so she's a woman, (laughs) even though she's married, taken care of, has money, every, you know, there's nothing victim-y about her. But, you know, ultimately, we were making fun of the victim, maybe, was a problem. Yes. <laughs> yes, because that is the, somebody asked us once. I never saw her as a victim, ever, because she was throwing herself into the meat grinder. So I never saw right. her as a victim. She'd get knocked over and then spin it, and I'll tell you what it really means, whether you believe her or not, you know. <laughs> I never saw her as the victim until that. And somebody, they asked us earlier, it, could this character exist in another, could she be a lawyer when they were interviewing us or way early? Could she be a lawyer? Could she be a doctor? And the reason we picked show business is I saw a lot of victimization of women in show business just in terms of the demographics. Just let's start there. Demographics. She goes to the table read and the other girls are 20. Because that's the demographic of what happened. So she wasn't a victim, but the the show was about how the industry victim is the victimization of people, right? Right, right. And so, and then the last thing I want to say is that I don't think it's like that right now, because of the despicable housewives of every city in America, and <laughs> they've now shown us how another kind of women that, that you don't have to feel sorry for. And that they're not victims, and they're just despicable. And they're Terrible. and and they are and they are fools. Mm-hmm. They are total you are, fools. They are right. fools, and you're laughing at their, well, their spin. Well, they're perpetrating it on themselves. I mean, they're almost the opposite of victims. Yes, but so is so is so was Valerie. Valerie. Yeah. But, but I just not, think. But Valerie was first. So that right. happened before these women, and and in a way, I'm kind of like grateful for whatever any woman wants to do now, that now we have another point of reference, (laughs) you know, for what a woman is. You know, it makes a lot of sense what you said. I I didn't understand it at first, but now I'm getting it. And I think that was probably a lot of what made it easier for them to cancel it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, the other thing about the probably the because I this really did strike me. I'm glad you asked this question. It's triggering triggering us up here, but um, that there was only one woman in the writers' room. That they were horrible to her. That she was fat. That she was an outcast. Um, a friend of mine right now is on a show where she's the only woman, and they're all super competitive, and they either ignore her or they kind of verbally brutalize her. You know her too. But but Robin, um, she yeah. wasn't fat. She got fat. In the writing room. But she room. started. She started. Oh, no, no. No. She was she eating got constantly. Fat out in of the writing room right. because of the environment. She started out as a cute, like you know, writer. Yeah. Right. But everybody was eating constantly, not just her. But she was eating in but a specific way. But we literally put Bane Gibby played uh, played uh, Gigi. We literally kept putting her in fat suits. That was her arc. Fatter and fatter and yeah. fatter. My dress ripped. Blah blah blah. But she wasn't in a fat suit at the top. Oh. She was just in a little jean jacket saying, "Hi, I'm the new writer." Right. I'm a playwright from New York. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Great question. I'm glad you, you triggered all that. But that's, I mean, again, that's what the show is. It's just like all these levels of stuff that just trigger the shit out of you. But yeah. what is your, what, did, what came out of your discussion? You said it came up? 
in um, your class? What? Yeah. Well, um, you know, we it was a film and media, and, and I guess it was about you know Marianne Doan and the male gaze, and um, yeah, I mean that was really fascinating, and oh. also weirdly it that show made me want to become a sitcom writer in this weird way because yeah. Get it. Well, uh, yes. Um, this actually isn't my question, but I just want to throw it into discussion right now. Is What do you think of Enlightened? Because they're on HBO. They got picked up. And I actually can't stand to watch it anymore because she is so, <laughs> like, you know, I don't know. Kind of the same quality you're talking about, the train wreck um, kind of thing. But that's not your question? That's not my question, but, but I know. But let's, let's, let's do that for a second. Okay. okay. Um, for Michael, uh, as a comedy director... Um, I know obviously the story dictates your directing style, whether it's multi-cam or single cam, but can you talk about directing um, for jokey comedy um, for single cam? Like, do you kind of just have to cover it, or can you be more creative? Or Well, this was tricky, this particular show, because at some point we had, like at one point we were doing the give her another shot, give her another shot. I had 11 cameras going. And Jimmy was like, what's going on in here? Where are the cameras? There's too many cameras. Uh, but for this, it was just trying to tell the f story on the fringe. You know what I mean? And as far as jokey, you know, just do the jokes. They're all different. You, for romantic comedy, you try to be still and beautiful. For this, you try to be handheld. For sitcoms, you try to move fast. You know, it's all very different. Do you want to respond to the question about Mike White's show? I mean, what, what was, I what was the, question what the question exactly? Was. The question is, it's kind of the same model where it's the woman who's the victim, and yet it got picked up, and, you know, like Lisa was saying, there are these other examples now, but I found myself just, maybe I'm editorializing now, but halfway through the first season, I, I can't watch it anymore. It's too painful. I don't know. Well, Valerie... <laughs> you know, that's all. Go Valerie down. Valerie is like, um, I, you know, it's just, it's, it's funny. And do you so, you I, know, like, I liked that show. Yeah. I love that show. I, I mean, we I had Mike White it. was our first guest. Yeah, and, we had him a few weeks and ago. And I just love, now I just have this insatiable hunger for stuff that just has that pain. I mean, maybe it's because I, I just started, I don't know, I just... I want to see that the per I guess the person who's the victim and the perpetrator and and has those moments where I just love her and then these other moments where it's like I would I would do what those other characters do and just disappear so I would not have to see her or have and lunch with her. The interesting thing about the character is she wants to be better. Yeah. So that does that make her a victim? It's just she's flawed. I like that whole notion of how when someone's on a search, in search of, and a searcher, and a quester, or whatever you're supposed to say about them, that they're that annoying and destructive, <laughs> and that that's I like that whole notion. Yeah, she's the most insensitive, yeah, <laughs> enlightened Flawed. person ever. So engrossed exactly. in her quest that everyone can go like fuck themselves because. But I think she's going to make the world better. You'll see. I mean, we don't usually, we usually try to talk more about craft than about the business, but I just think it's interesting because you were talking about the moment that HBO was in when they were filled with hits and kind of like, where's our, you know, our everything has to have a certain rating and it's going to be very high. And I think they're in a very different moment now, if I may say, and I think that's probably one of the reasons why, I, I, you know, I'm not saying, I love the show Enlightened, but I'm saying it's, I think HBO in a business sense is in a different place. No? I, yeah, I assume. I don't know. I don't really know either. Yes. Um, hi. Hi. I was going to ask something similar to what she said. I was going to ask if you think maybe the problem during that time was the timing, that maybe people were not ready for that. I That's, read, yeah. But she said something, almost what I was going to say. Look. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that was my question. <laughs> <laughs> gotten credit for the comment <laughs> a moment earlier. I mean it's yeah. it's thrilling to be ahead of the curve if that's indeed what happens because then you people catch up and you get to talk about it later yeah. um, it's hard because you're the first people showing up yeah. and uh, who knows everything was it all happened and it and yet we're still talking about it so that's thrilling 
Absolutely. And how many years later then, I'm sorry I have to say this, it was so thrilling to be on like Entertainment Weekly's top shows of the decade. Yeah. And one Newsweek. season, it was like 12 or 13 episodes. It was just, that was really nice. It was, that was justly deserved. Justly deserved. Thank you. Uh, yes. Um, you talk about the show being ahead of the curve. Where do you think the curve is going now? Having seen the victim portrayed, which is obviously what you broke the ground with. I didn't know we had to define the curve. <laughs> it's <just> saying. <laughs> Uh-oh, Michael. <laughs> well, Michael's on the curve right now, having I mean, uh, co-created. I guess you just... You know, like Lisa said, I have this great idea or this character. No, she didn't say I have this great idea. She would never say that. She said, I like, I'm fascinated by this person. And then I was like, that's hilarious. And then the curve is not your business. All, all your business is, is like, well, if we're going to do that, what's happening right now that that person would exist in to just reflect the world that is there? And then you just guess. Like, well, it might get worse, but it was right. really, there's no curve. Now we're over the past the curve because it was canceled. So we can say it was ahead of the curve, but if it hadn't been canceled, we would have been on the curve maybe. But you just don't know what it is. And also the fact that the, that they were both at a certain moment in time, they could do whatever they wanted. But I, I mean, again, this is triggering me because I feel like I have horrible timing and that I've always been way ahead of the curve. I mean, when you think Lisa started in, in Ladies Room, did you see Ladies Room, yeah. Michael? I, there was this play that was just really like women talking in a very sexual way. And this was in 1988 was the first production. And and I didn't really think I was doing I knew I I didn't think I was ahead of any curve. And then I was like. 12 years ahead of the curve. And then I got that curve. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you hit the curve. I was on that curve. <laughs> yeah. That one I got. That's yeah. Right. That That's happened right, right I, then. I'm just praying that my curve, that somehow or other my timing is going to work out. But I, um, I think what we've noticed um, talking to writers and being writers um, is that, I don't know, are you a writer? I am. Yeah. Well, I think then I will just be pontificating for a second that if you place your focus on that, it's like what Michael was saying, you're really going to miss something important, which is what are you fascinated by? What's freaking you out? What's upsetting you the most? I mean, if you are really other focused, like what are other people thinking is the thing that's going to maybe, that is such not where you want to be in terms of your writing life. It's not a good place to be. I mean, you're right. And the the greatest joy of being here tonight is that Lisa and I were fascinated by this. And, and, it, and, it, and we just, fought, oh, and we were in sync. But and crazily in sync. I mean, Michael inhabited this character in this world. I, I don't know who I ever would have been able to do this with, ever. Ditto. <laughs> but isn't that just what it is? Like, that's the beauty of, I mean, it feels like a miracle whenever you find that person or persons that you can actually do it with, do this thing with, it's amazing. It's a miracle. And there's wind. There is an effortless wind that comes from, now that doesn't mean it's going to work for anybody else, but suddenly you're just uh, running like a dog that doesn't know it's on a leash, just like running and running and running. And then maybe if you're lucky, it gets made. I mean, I had actually tried to write a pilot once a few years before this. And so when Michael and I were working, I said, wow, this seems, I mean, this seems kind of easy in a way. Am I crazy? I mean, is it always like this for you then? Like, because he's a great writer. And he, he was like, no, no, this is easy. This is weird. This is weird. It took us how many weeks? Like three to write the pilot. Right? Am I nuts? No, I don't I remember don't things. But I think it was like three weeks, and we were. It was basically. But, but this had choices. been. This had been. This had been marinating because you said you had this character forever. So. Yeah, but then we made up all these other characters. Yeah. We just made them up. Yeah. yeah. That but had that to inform then. Are based out on our characters. our years in prisons, on sitcoms. <laughs> so 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 when you have a connection like that, that's really, that's really magical in that way. Do you feel like it behooves me to do it again, or do you, or do you feel like, oh my God, in a way it can, it's never going to be that way? I mean, what do you feel like? I'm terrified. 
care, Stephanie. Don't worry. <laughs> Lisa's worry. a little bit more terrified about a, a, a attempting Valerie again. Well, I actually wasn't talking about no. attempting Valerie again. No, I was uh, talking about writing. just the two of you collaborating again. Right, right. I, I have no Not fear. with him. Not terrified to work with him. That, because I know. Oh, of, but I need to sit down and write something. It's like, oh, no. I don't know. Oh, well, listen. I mean, I'm just saying, what about... Like, I, look. Lisa, no, we can you know. talk about terror all night long. Oh I mean, I'm a room full of writers. I have you never gotten know what I'm talking over the about. terror. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in other words, if you say I'm terrified and I go, well, that's just a normal day. Like, that's just how it is every day. Um, uh, yes. Thank you again for being here and for creating such an amazing show that I, uh, I was the one just chastising my friend. You have to watch this. It's really good. It's really good. So. I'm sure everyone here did that too. Uh, anyway, I've also heard you say in interviews that sometimes when you guys get together, you talk about where Valerie would be right now. Curious where, where she would be right now and maybe some of the other characters as well. Well, I don't know. Go ahead. Tonight's well, we, the only we, one we didn't talk about it. <laughs> uh, we do. Lisa and I have talked about the fact that Valerie would definitely be trying to get into Andy Cohen's office <laughs> to say, I, I am those girls. I mean, we knew that Valerie would be trying to get on Bravo. And claiming that she was ahead of the curve <laughs> before. Mm -hmm. She lived in Beverly Hills before any of them. <laughs> right, but then it would be, we thought it would be very fun to see her with some of those housewives, and she can't get a word in. She's not nearly aggressive enough. It's hilarious. And it's she'd hilarious. be the dullest character on any of those shows. <laughs> right, because she would seem work. sane compared to those women. Right. She would seem like she actually was sane. Well, also, it's like she's all about appearances, and they're all about, like, vicious, like the things that I would never want people, I would never behave that way, but I certainly wouldn't want anyone to see it, and it's like, I'm just going to punch her. I mean, I'm just going to punch that woman. I, I, I just, actually... Like, like, uh, like, my favorite line in reality shows is, this is not the time. <laughs> Like, my favorite women. line is, this is my time. This is my That's time. my my time, favorite time. My time to shine. But my time to shine. They all say that. Like women in general in real life will do anything not to have an uncomfortable conversation with anybody. And these women are like, it's your birthday party. And I, that thing that happened two years ago, we're going to talk about it right now. <laughs> or I'm fired. I, I actually do think Valerie would be Valerie would definitely be trying to get something going. There'd be a there'd be a thing because she's not done. Wherever she is, she's at Bristol Farms, <laughs> looking at a magazine, thinking, "No, I'm not done." She'd be getting something going. That's what I like about the idea of her. She's not done. Well, I it's think like she's the hungry still... ghost, you know, the Buddhist. I don't know what he is. He's like a Buddhist figure, and it's like the big. He's like this big fat guy who's got the, a mouth the size of a pin, and no matter how much he eats, he's still hungry. The neck is so skinny that he go he keeps eating, but it doesn't go in, it doesn't go down. He's always hungry. He's always hungry. It's something it's with his mouth pilot. or his neck, but like, he can't get enough food. He's like, boo, I'm hungry. <laughs> he said, hungry ghost. I was like, whoa, what do you got? <laughs> What'd you have? He's like Casper I'm, the Hungry Ghost. What's the leftovers? <laughs> um, do we have more questions? Uh, yes. That guy. So we've totally turned into a 12-step, you know, people who are addicted to come back uh, and need this meeting somehow. <laughs> uh, uh, but um, I'm wondering about the comeback of the comeback. And if you, because Michael referenced very early tonight, hours ago, about the clout, <laughs> right? There is not a chain on you. <laughs> you know, you had the clout, right? And you guys worked that. I mean, part of, you know, a, a room of writers thinks about, yeah, but you are you guys and we're not. But you still are those people. And so, you know, sometimes shows migrate to other networks. Not Bravo, maybe. But... Maybe part of the problem is that you turned the camera around to the network a little too incisively, let's say. Because um, I'm thinking about the movie The Player, and at one point, you know, Tim Robbins' character sort of says, you know, well, we can get rid of the writers too, to Peter Gallagher's character, the new young guy, right? Because who needs writers? You know, we'll just pick a story out of the newspaper. And, and he makes it a joke, makes their whole business a joke. And a, 
you know, in the very opening scene when Valerie goes in in the pilot and wants that private room, she's got no clout anymore. She's just the talent. And so I'm wondering, you know, is there a way that you can still play the comeback to try to like take it somewhere else, or has it maybe told too much of the truth? Oh, that's a good. No, I wonder all the time. What you're staring at me? What can I do? I want to see melt down right now. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered that. I, I, I have I, to say, I don't know. I, I just think there's always more truth. There's a. Well, we already did. <laughs> so there would be maybe more no, they, where they wouldn't want to hear. I mean, if we couldn't even do it on HBO, then where on earth? The internet. I love that it, I love that there's so many people here in denial that this show is over. <laughs> Everyone's like, no, no, don't you understand? You can go to another network. Yeah, it's, oh, it's can we turn the air conditioning up? Or is it just me who's boiling hot? It's not just you, but, I mean, hours ago. Oh. Now we're just used to it. I mean, I almost fainted several hours ago, but now I'm fine. <laughs> that would have been beautiful to see. Winnie just like, and Swan-like. anyway. Swan-like. <laughs> Top up over. There was somebody here. Right here. Okay. Oh. Um, so perhaps this is just another testament of what a great thing you guys have created. There's someone out there, um, if I don't know if you're aware, tweeting as Valerie Cherish. Right, there is there, someone. It's not me. Oh, I was wondering if it was, you had anything to do with it. But he's very good. He is very good. He's very good. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. I've tweeted him. I, I like how we assume it's, it's a him. It he's just tweeting as him now. I couldn't now. help it. No. <laughs> He got me so excited about something like a Christmas gift, and I had a joke in my head, and I couldn't help it. So I tweeted, I have an idea for what Valerie might get. What's a Francesca? And I <laughs> got suckered into it. Yeah. It's funny. Oh, Too fun. I couldn't was, resist. Yeah, that's adorable. I didn't know that that was going on, but that's really funny. Um, that's also a big compliment. There's I mean, a couple of Valerie's on YouTube, too. Uh, guys and girls with towel, red towels on their hair. <laughs> going, Mickey, Mickey. I mean, <laughs> not that I look. <laughs> <laughs> More questions in the back? I just wanted to say I love, I love TV movies, and I love um, when she says a line about that Hallmark movie I did about the woman with the terrible headaches. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to know more about that. And I also wanted to know um, if it was hard to uh, get um, Kim, Kim Fields and Mary Lou Henner for the scene they were in. Was it hard to find actresses that would do that scene where they were portrayed on a Valerie level? Well, I was going to ask that question. That's Thank you. Our, our, our um, holy grail that got away was Marky Post. She wanted no part of it. And we just thought, Marky Post. <laughs> That says it all. It seemed perfect how you had it. They were it. good. I mean, they were, they were, it was a bit of a snake charming situation, just like, you know, trying to repre- to not be the joke and be in the joke. Right. You know, that they had to be charmed to say it'll be cool because you're in it. And Mary Lou and, and Kim were very game. Well, but, but also to get we, them there was a charming situation. Oh, well, I didn't see it that way. I just saw that. What we had to make sure we were doing is not making fun of them. And I thought we did that pretty well by having them say, what, no reality cameras for this? Are you nuts? It's, you know, I'll do a sitcom, but I don't even know if I want to do the reality show. Perfect. Yeah, it just so pointed out. Valerie is the only one who's like, I think this is in the bag because <laughs> they're not as smart as I am <laughs> in understanding. Yeah. yeah, it ended up being exposition for her, in addition to being this wonderful, you know, like pop of, oh my God, it's really happening. Yeah. Uh, right. Also, that pilot was supposed to be women, you know, like late 30s who were successful, and it was supposed to be sort of like a designing women type show anyway. Right. So, right. yeah. She was an architect. Right. <laughs> An architect is one of those jobs where everyone feels like they know what it is, but no one ever has to really go to work. Right. I mean, it's, no, it's like one of those, like... But you know the clothes are good. Yeah. Yeah. They command respect. Yeah. Uh, they, they just need, like, whole blueprints. Oh, oh thank, thank you. you. But the truth is, that makes it sound like we're staying all night, and the truth is we have to wrap up. 
Do we have one I more question? Say, I would say one yes. more. Yes. This better really be good. No pressure on you or anything. Um, I was going to ask Lisa, I know on the commentary and tonight you make a clear distinction between Lisa and Valerie, and I was wondering if in the playing of Valerie it was any different from the other characters you've played on TV and film and like how self-aware you are as an actress and as a character, if that makes sense. No, it's a great question that I'm asking myself all the time. <laughs> For the first part, in my head, there's a huge difference in the characters I play, in my head. And whether you can see them or not is another story. <laughs> but, um, and then see myself as what? Like, I mean, I think I answered it by saying I ask myself that all the time, and I'm so afraid. Well, you know, like some actors are always like, when they're in character, they say I. Like, but it oh, seems like you're like... I say she. She, yeah. I always say she. It's another... Person you feel like you're me. not like you feel like they're a different person. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty automatic for me to say she. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what that's about. I mean, because there are it's not you. I mean, there's certain actors where what they do. Jennifer Aniston, for example, she's got a. It's almost like a brand. It's it's who she is as. It seems like it's who she is as a person. Right. You're always playing completely different like characters. Cary Grant too. So yeah, there's there's you know even Bill Murray. I mean, there's a lot of Jennifer people Aniston, that have like a a specific um, you know persona, and Lisa really doesn't. So they really are she's. Yeah, and when we would write. The difference between Lisa would go, oh, and then she, like, Lisa would get a kick out of, and then she doesn't know, <laughs> like, that but you can she's see how said that. Lisa knows enough to say, because Lisa, whether she wants me to say this or not, has great self-awareness, and everything's very aware uh, and in check, ego, et cetera, and what she loved, and why Valerie is a she and not a I, is the the biggest like part of this T-bone steak for Lisa was that Valerie didn't know. So it would always be she doesn't know this or she went there. Oh, and then she says. So, so it was Lisa, never me. Lisa, did you ever, now that we're talking about the weirdness of this, did you ever like write something that you would have written for she? And did you ever think, oh, shit, now I got to do that? Or did oh, everything? Yeah. yeah. I don't know specifically what, because I'm very good at blocking things out. Yeah. <laughs> things that I'm not comfortable with and don't ever want to fully address. Like, there are so many, like... Yeah. Like vomiting. Well, okay. Yes. Well, yeah, part of my brain knows, well, this is how it has to go. Well, who's going to play that? Or a sex scene with Mark where it's like, oh, yeah, great. They have to. Fantastic. Can wh Where are they going to be, though? Let's not see it. I don't want to do that. I don't get naked, Michael. And then there's this whole panic as I... <laughs> The, uh, again, these the, for whatever reason, maybe it's because I know you, the things that make me cringe, again, like so much of it, but when when um, Francesca wants to, she's going to go off with Francesca for a bonding moment, and then she goes, ch ch, -ch changes I mean, it literally, like... <laughs> me too! Oh, my God! I watched it! Me too! And the Woody Allen! Oh, yeah, the like, Woody Allen. Oh, my God, she thinks she does a good Woody Allen! <laughs> Ouch! It's so embarrassing, and the changes. She thinks she's doing such a good David Bowie, and it's just. But then, how do you like? Put the blinders she... on when you're shooting it. Like, how do you? No, I think it's funny that a person you have to commit all the way. That's what I love, Lucy. I love because she was so committed in every moment. You know, she would be really angry, and you know, not indicating. She was just really being it and doing it, and so you have to really. Be it and do it, and be bad, thinking that it's really good. She has to be tone deaf, you know. That's just a big lesson for almost everything, starting with writing, acting, and life is is commit. Commit. I was gonna say. You know, we all here have an improv background, and one of the huge rules in improv is commit, and it almost always works. Even if you screw up the improv game, it almost always works if you commit. And that's Lisa is fearless about committing. And um, and, yeah. and clearly Michael Patrick is. And I think the thing that makes the show so completely unforgettable is how deeply you committed. I mean, that level of commitment to that idea 
in all of its complexity, that is what, that's what is, you know, getting us. That's what went right in, in there and, and lodged in our hearts. We'll never, we'll never forget that incredible show. I mean, this is what we chose to do with our life, so yeah. Great questions. Yeah. I mean, it's very 